Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. This is KLOS New and Approved. And I've got Kevin Cronin from REO Speedwagon. And I'm very excited to talk to Kevin because I first went to see Kevin when I was uh, a young teen playing live and uh, became a fan right at that moment and uh, went out and bought their double live album after I saw them play that night. So it's great to see Kevin again. Kevin, welcome to the show. It's great to see you. Man, good to be here, Matt. Uh, you know, we were just saying last time we uh, we spoke was at the uh, at the Kaboom Festival, which, uh, as we said, has since gone kaboom. Yeah. But Matt, it was a I hadn't been to a festival in a long time. And I stayed for the whole weekend, man. I saw, I saw Dave Matthews. I saw Mumford and Sons, Cheryl Crow, Brian Adams. I mean, it was just like, and everyone sounded great, looked great. Uh, I just, I, and of course, as we were saying, my son's band uh, played on a <clears throat> on a smaller stage with uh, Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders, and uh, so that, so I, you know I had a great time. I you know I had a great time playing the gig, but I also had a great time just being an audience member because I don't get a chance to do that often. So it was really cool. Yeah, it was awesome. It was the last time I got to talk to you there, and, and it was cool that your son's band. I remember I interviewed those guys too, and you know it's I'm glad your son is following in your footsteps, Kevin, which is amazing. You know. Well, you know, I, I got twin boys that just yeah. turned 22. And, uh, and and so they're both in the band. Shane is the lead singer. Josh is the bass player, songwriter. And, you know, uh, uh, Michael Lease, who's Howard Lease of Hart's son, is in the band, just coincidentally. And uh, and they, they're they just, man, they're working hard. They're called Sir Please. They got music up on uh, Spotify and uh, et cetera. And they're, uh, you know, they're finding their way. They're doing their thing. It's pretty cool. That is cool. It's great. It's great to see that. Speaking of which, Kevin, it's amazing. I, you know, I look back at your history, you know, with REO, and uh, I know you were like on REO too. You left for a couple of years, but uh, but then came back, and then the really uh, the great year started when you came back. For me, I mean, that's you know one of my favorite songs by the band ever is a song that you wrote called "Keep Pushing," which I love. It's just like this really great song to give you like optimism and strength to get through some stuff and. Uh, I always, I still love that song. And there's two versions. There's the one on the REO album and then the live, You Get What You Play For, which are both great. Um, talk to me about growing up, you know, outside in the suburbs of Chicago there, like, you know, I think it's called Evanston, or was that where it was, or was it around that area? Yeah, yeah I was born in Evanston, and Ray, that, which is on the north side of Chicago, and then um, my dad moved the family down to the south side. So, um, so I grew up in the south suburbs of Chicago. What was it like? Do you remember the first time you heard yourself on the radio uh, when you heard the band on the radio? Do you remember what song it was and where you were that at that very time? Well, the the, the one that 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 really um, made an impact on me was, uh, you know, and uh, uh, coincidentally, it was on KLOS. But uh, I was uh, living in Woodland Hills at the time and just driving, driving down Ventura Boulevard. And Roll With The Changes came on the radio. And, and you know, th that record was huge be for us because uh, you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish was the first time that the record label let us produce our own record. Uh, you know, we had made, it was our, I think our eighth album. And, you know, up until then, the, the record company had just kind of assigned us producers and when we, you know, when we, we took a look at the songs we had written for, for You Can Tune a Piano, But You Can't Tune a Fish, there was just, there were just too many songs that both Gary Richrath, the late, great Gary Richrath and I uh, thought were strong. We didn't want to take any chances of putting them in the hands of a, of a producer who may, may or may not do them justice. So anyway, man, when I heard... Uh, uh, rolled the changes on the radio. I, I literally had to pull the car over and I started crying. I'll be honest with you. It just brought tears to my eyes. And I just felt like, cause it sounded good. You know, it sounded, just sounded powerful on the radio, exactly how you would want it to sound. And, and uh, you know, and the song, it's, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's an important song to me. And uh, to, just to hear it, like you say, for the first time, driving in los angeles uh it was a, it was a moment i'll never forget i remember how happy i was when that broke through and also in roll with the changes was starting to get national airplay uh it made me super happy because you know i was a fan of the band 
uh, at which was so cool. And, you know, I want to talk to you about that because it was interesting how there were certain parts of the country where you guys were getting the exposure, uh, you know, in the Midwest and other places. But when I first saw you in New York City, um, you know, that's how I discovered you playing live. And I would think that a lot of the audience was probably people that were also transplants and some other people like myself who were young were just discovering you guys at that period of time. For the live album, you get what you play for, that great right. double live record. Um, and I heard Like You Do, and I went, wow, this is, man, who are these guys? And I was really excited. And again, you, you had a new fan in me, like, right after that. Um, oh, that's awesome. Which was cool. Tell me about that that tour in particular, because it's so amazing. Uh, you know, I've had Rob Halford here on the show, and he talked about just how great you treated him, how much he loved you guys, because that was Judas Priest's first U.S. tour, if I'm, if I'm almost positive, because right. they were on an indie label. Then they had their first album on Columbia, Sin After Sin. It was that tour. And, you know, stars were the band in the middle uh, in, right. in, in, New York, in New York. And uh, I remember discovering Judas Priest the same day. And they, you know, might have had, you know, three feet to play on, you know, like any <laughs> opening band. does. Everybody's got to go through that, you know. But tell me about that, because... Uh, you guys have forged a friendship. You guys have been friends for years because of that. Let's talk about that. Well, you know, we I, I recently, uh, maybe a year or two ago, did a, a, a show on uh, Comedy Central. I, I can't think of the name of it, but it was uh, a number of comedians who had a, a connection to rock and roll, a certain band, a certain song. And uh, so uh, I did a thing with Mark Duplass, which was, he's just a hilarious dude, great guy. And as I was walking off stage, uh, I bump into Rob Halford, you know, and he's he's like, you know, looking like a million bucks, you know, leathered up, you know, and the whole thing. And as I'm coming down the stage, he gives me a, this, you know, just like a, a just a, just a big hug, you know, and 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 he looked me in the eyes and he's like, man, he goes, our first tour, you guys treated us better than any other band we ever played with. Well, there's a reason for that. And, th and that's because, you know, we learned early on that because we got, you know, we toured with Grand Funk Railroad, uh, Canned Heat, a number of bands when they went through the Midwest, picked up REO. When they went through Texas, they picked up ZZ. When they went to, through the Southeast, they picked up uh, Leonard Skinner, right? And they would give us like maybe one spotlight, you know, no monitors. They, they just like, they, they were, I don't know why, I don't know why they treated us that way, but, um, but then we did a, a, a short tour with Aerosmith and first night of the tour, Joe and Steven come in the dressing room, sit on, they hang, they give us full lights, full sound, invited us to, you know, to their meal every night, to their party every night. And we're like, well, this is the way to do it. And, and their theory was the better we sound and, the, and the, the better we go over, the audience is going to be psyched up. And, and then it, it, just, it just makes them work a little harder, you know, and that's how it's supposed to be. You know, you want the whole show to, you know, to you want the audience to walk out of there feeling like they got their ass kicked in a good way, you know. So, so we, yeah, we, um, we, I remember Judas Priest from, you know, be, as, if you remember that that was pre-leather man that they were just an english rock band at that point and, and at some point after that they they kind of changed their image and that and that's when they hit big and uh yeah i've always got a, a soft spot in my heart for, for rob and those guys i'm always rooting for them yeah you know there's 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 was talk that some of that might have leather might have been influenced by you know rob making it out to the west village while he was there on that tour with you guys you know so i think that he might have been man. You know, which is which is amazing. But I love I love that uh, that story. That's great, and it's good to hear the Aerosmith guys were so cool to you back in the day as well. You know, I, I, I will never forget those guys because you you know that we had been accustomed to being to the 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 headliners kind of being a little intimidated because we were you know we were young and hungry and we were we were rocking hard and you know the and I think maybe some of the bands we toured with were. I don't know. I, I don't know what the problem was, but uh, anyway, it was it was it was great to tour with Aerosmith, and and that's you know that's the right way to treat people, and we've we've been that way ever since. I I, I and I completely believe that, and, and knew that would be the way that you guys were. You could just tell, you know, which is amazing. Now let's let's talk about so we we talk about you know literally you you can't tune a piano you can tune a piano but you can't tune a fish was like really paving the way, and then of course 
High Infidelity was the, you know, 10 million sold, hit after hit on that record. It was amazing just to see how things exploded. And I got to talk to you about that. What I loved, you were in that, you know, I want my MTV documentary on a and and I love the self-deprecating style. You were like, well, you know how those videos look now. And it's funny. When you look back on that period, um, do you feel in a big way that MTV was a big part of, of bringing it to the next level in that when it was in its infancy back then? Well, you know, it was, Matt, it was the timing of it, you know, couldn't have been more, you, you couldn't have scripted it any better for, for us because, you know, our album, you know, hit in, at the, in like March of 1981. And, uh, and we were kind con- and, and you, you know, this, we were a Midwest band. We, we could, we were playing, you know, arenas and stadiums in, in St. Louis, Kansas City, Indianapolis. And then we'd get out to New York and we'd, we could bear, you know, we'd be lucky if we could headline CBGBs, you know, it was, it was that type of thing. And uh, with with High Infidelity, suddenly, it, you know, the whole thing exploded. And right in the middle of that explosion, MTV came on. And uh, so we went from being a faceless, the, 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 our, our, uh, our, uh, reputation in the press was we were a faceless Midwest band and suddenly MTV came along and uh you know and our faces were you know were in in every living room in America so it it really helped us and uh the videos you know I'm not so sure the videos you know acting is uh certainly not my strong point as is evidenced by those uh, videos that I uh, prefer uh, would, would, would be burned and never seen again. But of course they're on YouTube every day. So what are you going to do? But it was great, you know, and I think one of the other things that was so cool about REO was you embraced the video medium, no matter what you think of the video saying, because of course all videos, unless it was like, you know, something like Rio or, or Durander where they filmed it on location in Sri Lanka you know, you were working with what you had, and it was, it was a, really a pretty new medium. I mean, you know, other than what the UK artists who had been doing that for quite a while. Um, but you were, the, like, really the first U.S. artist to embrace the medium and use it. And I thought that was a very cool thing. Because as we well, learned... You know, it- the, what, what's weird is, you know, when we made those videos, Matt, we, we had made a couple of videos before then. And, and and those videos, well, we made the videos just because the record company wanted us to, but we didn't know why we were making videos. You know, we would play on uh, Midnight Special, you know, and Don Kirshner's rock concert, you know, the, the weekend live music shows, which were, that was pretty much the only rock and roll on TV. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that was cool because you played live. There was no post-production, no overdubs, no nothing. It was just a, a live performance. So that was pretty cool. But I think they might have started using music videos a little bit on those shows. Maybe that's why we were doing the videos. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but uh, about a year before MTV came out, they th- their original concept was was that the, uh, the VJs were going to be front men uh, from various, you know, uh, you know, famous rock bands, right? So they they brought me out to new, my, my publicist said, "You got to come to a meeting with me with these these guys from Warner, I think Warner Communications or whatever." And we had this meeting, and and th- and they're telling me about this concept, and I'm listening. And at the end of the whole, it can, and they like I was on their short list. They were hoping to get Steven Tyler, Alice Cooper. Um, uh, Peter Wolf from Jay Giles. And I, at the end of the meeting, I'm like, guys, you don't understand. All the people that you're hoping you're going to get to sit in a studio and introduce videos for four hours a day are all in touring bands. We, we, none of us, you're not going to get any of us to do this. And yeah. they looked at each other like, oh, shoot, we never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, and that's so, amazing. Yeah, so. And then, of course, that paved the way for, like, you know, Alan Hunter and uh, Mark Goodman and all those guys and uh, the original five. But um, that that's incredible. I do, I you know, I, I could see that happening. And, you know, of course, over time, you know, now that it's years later, you know, people will do more TV stuff. But at that time, you guys, that's what it was all about. You guys were on the road and touring. Yeah. Know? What Tom- helped us, Matt? It helped us because cause people you know, we, we didn't have that, uh, that East coast or, or West coast 
support from even from the rock media. I mean, we finally, in when the Tuna Fish album came out, uh, a, a, a journalist named Mick, Mitch Schneider, who's become uh, he was our he became our publicist years later, and he's still a friend. He wrote a re we finally got a, a piece in Rolling Stone, and that, that was it was our eighth album, you know. So we yeah. were struggling just to get anyone in the press to pay attention to us. So we didn't we didn't have the the uh, the luxury of having our you know pictures on the cover of Rolling Stone or anything. The only way that we got in into so that people actually could see us and and know what we were about was really MTV, and they were right there, right when High Fidelity was at its peak. And uh, you know, it was it was really lucky for us that it that it happened the way it did. And I think that you know we definitely owe MTV for just taking us to a, to another level. And 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 actually, I think we kind of helped them out too because our band was so uh, we had exploded in in such a big way that year that the fact that we embraced them it was there was a good synergy there and it and uh you know mark goodman's a friend to this day yeah he's such a great guy you know he, he, mark mark's awesome and you know of course from his, his radio days before that as well you know uh, i mean it was uh it was a sad day in rock and roll when when we lost gary richrath i mean you know your your partner in songwriting and and playing all those years great guitars killer look you know he always was uh his vibe, you know, I, uh, Gary was great. That that had to be that that period of time. I mean, to lose somebody who was a creative partner for all that year, that that was uh, the story behind you know him just you know having some stomach issues and then and then going in and really losing him was uh, that was a heartbreaking moment, you know. And, and it was crazy. it was crazy. And I, and I I'll tell you this: Gary Richrath belongs in the conversation, in my opinion, uh, as one of the great rock guitarists of all time. He had, like you say, he had a look, uh, and a and a way that he that he he caressed that guitar. He, the 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 guitar became part of him, and he had you know the leather strap guitar strap with the fringe on it, and the and he played. It was a Les Paul, a coil cord, and a Marshall stack, and and sometimes he'd plug it through a wah wah pedal. That was it, man. He created the sound. It was just so raw and so organic, and. I mean, I owe so much to him. He, he's the guy who found me when I was a folk singer in Chicago. I was my band sounded more like Buffalo Springfield than than Ario Speedwagon. You know, I used to play a Rickenbacker twelve string, and Gary, Gary. You know, so long story. I, I'm almost finished with my book. I started. I accidentally started writing a book uh, just over five years ago, and it really tells the the whole story of. Uh, you know of how Gary and I started, and and it's it's it, it's as much Gary's story as it is mine, and, and the story of the band. And but uh, yeah, he 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 gets overlooked, and and I don't understand it. And because uh, you know anyone who's when well, you saw him, it, it, yeah. you got to see him live. He, yeah. he just come, he you killed. remember he would he killed it. He, he was would, great. in the middle of our show. He, we we would all leave the stage. And he didn't have a vocal mic. He stood on stage with his Les Paul and entertained the crowd for like 10 or 15 minutes every night. And the, he would he would hold a stadium spellbound, man. And he would he would play, but he would play with them, you know. And he had a way of bringing the crowd in without saying a word. You know, I used to say, you know, Gary talks with his guitar, and he surely did. And you know, he his music and his spirit lives on, man. We play we play a number of songs that Gary wrote uh, in our live set uh, today, you know, to this day. Yeah, I mean it's a and uh, yeah we he certainly missed and uh, you know he was he was great. I'm so glad I got to see you guys more than once uh, with Gary then. But I'm so, I'm awesome. also very happy that you know that you guys are continuing on and, and touring because you know you have this incredible body of work and music you know that people need to hear. But I was it's funny you brought up the autobiography. I'm excited about that because uh, you know I heard you were doing that. That's going to come out this year, right? Uh, 2022. How you know you I hope. So. I hope so. I keep thinking that I'm finished with it. And then uh, I don't know if you've ever written a book, but you know, like, like you think you're finished. And then it's like, all right, I'm just going to go back to the beginning and just read it through and just, you know, just maybe move a comma here or you yeah. know, something like And then you start reading through and you're like, wait a minute, I can make this better. I can make that better. But I did, I did turn it in 
you know, I've got a, uh, you know, the, the literary agent at, at our booking agency, CNA, CNA, <laughs> CAA, uh, uh, has got the book and and she's uh, she's read it and she we're working together so it's it's getting pretty exciting r- right about now and then you know I, and I, the book you know it's important to me to tell the story of obviously of Gary and I and of of Ario and the the crazy road stories and stuff but you know it's also the story of my life and you know I will tell you that uh, no one would have accused me in high school of being voted most likely to succeed you know i was most likely to get my ass kicked you know more than anything and so you know so my story is is really um you know a story for for every man and it's it's just a story of you know you you mentioned my song keep pushing that that's what it's that that's really what it's been about for me is is you just you know when when an obstacle presents itself you figure out a way to to get through it get over it get around it and you keep moving forward and uh you know and eventually you know i think that's how that's how you make your dreams come true and and uh you know i've been i've been very fortunate i've worked hard and uh you know but hey man it was the beatles on the ed sullivan show in 1964 i mean i was sitting there like every other rock musician of 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 my era and we were all watching that show man and it's it's not a coincidence that there were so many bands that were that the guys were you know 12 13 14 years old when the Beatles hit and I mean how many bands are there that 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 the guys in the band were that old at that time it's it's no coincidence you know and picked up an instrument shortly thereafter and wanted to start a band immediately you know immediately right I mean it changed uh it changed everything which is amazing well dude here here's the here's the deal I've been taking guitar lessons for about two years and I didn't know why I was playing you know on top of old Smokey you know uh, you know just you know silly old folk songs and but i knew how to play the guitar i knew how to play chords i knew and when the beatles came out and i saw them it's like and, uh, and plus i'd be walking to my guitar lesson right in a car load of uh, high school dudes would pull up and just because i had a guitar you know in the the town where i grew up i was like a, a weirdo because i played guitar so i would be like you know have to jump a fence you know run through a yard to get to my guitar lesson you know and then the Beatles came out and the same guys who had been trying to kick my ass on Saturday on Monday they all wanted to be in a band with me because I was the only one in the neighborhood who could play the guitar so things change that quickly that's amazing that's such a great story yeah I mean I can't ra- wait to read all these stories in your book you know you know it's you know I, I wrote a book in in like 2015 that came out in 2016 so i know but it's funny how so much stuff changes and you rethink and go oh man i what have i i I should have told that story you know what i mean but but you got at some point you got to say all right it's done you know like yeah yeah. Yeah. i'm gonna put it out the only thing i changed in my book was bowie had died before it had come out and there was a chapter about bowie and my relationship with him and that i changed the ending of i was able to do that before the book came out but um you know just me, it was like COVID, you know, like r- r- I thought the book was done in early 2020. And then, uh, you know, then COVID came out. I'm like, well, God, I can't re- release a book now, you know, with, with, with no reference to COVID. And, and then I started, then, you know, you start rethinking the whole thing. So you and Bowie were, were tight. Huh? That, that, that must have been t- difficult for you. And, I, you know, I, it's driving me crazy that these, that these artists that were so influential and so, you know, had such a big impact, you know, our passing away. It's just weird. These guys all seemed immortal to me when I was a kid, yes. you know? Oh, yeah, I feel the same way. And I, um, you know, it's uh, every time uh, we lose somebody that we, we loved and their music meant so much to us, it's 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 an incredibly hard day, you know? Uh, yeah. It, it really is. But, you know, let's talk about these shows you have coming up because I'm excited. you got two L.A. shows uh, coming up, you've got, you're going to be in the area, which is great, Southern California, because as you know, KLOS has one of the best signals in the country. I mean, it's it's a blowtorch of a signal uh, for rock all sure over is. Southern California. On a good day, you can hear it all the way to the Mexican border, all the way out Death Valley, and that's a beautiful thing, you know. So I love that you guys are playing um, on the 12th. Yeah, you're playing at in Thousand Oaks. 
Um, and I think it's a it's a civic center there. And then you're doing a show also on the 14th in Anaheim. So there's some really – you have those shows coming up. Your son's band's going to open, which is really cool. And then let's talk about the summer tour because you guys are going out with your old friend Styx and, uh, and yep. Loverboy as well. So let's talk about that tour. Well, that, that's – you know, I'm just psyched about that. I mean, obviously, you know, we're going to play – uh, some shows between now and when the when the uh, Sticks Loverboy tour starts in June, and uh, yeah, we're we're playing. You know, we I live in Thousand Oaks, and uh, and the Thousand Oaks uh, Civic Theater has been so kind to us. They, you know, after you know during the pandemic, obviously we were off the road for a year and a half, and you know you get a little rusty uh, after all that time, and so we needed a couple of weeks of rehearsal. And normally we go over to Mates, you know, our buddy Bobby over there at Mates uh, takes yeah. good care of us. But the commute is a killer. So I was just like, you know, there's nothing going on at the Civic Theater. Maybe they'll let us rehearse there. And sure enough, they did, man. They opened up the theater to us for two weeks, let us get our everything together. And and we promised we'd play a show for them uh, this year. So so we keep our promises. And uh, and then we're, yeah, then we're doing the, 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 the theater, I, I can't, you know, Forgive me, the, the name of it has changed a few times over the years, but it used to be the Grove in An- yeah. Anaheim. It's a cool, cool little venue. And my boys, Josh and Shane and Sir Please, are going to be opening the show. And I tell you what, you know, they're my kids. They're, there's a little nepotism involved, n- no doubt, but they earn it because they these these kids are they write amazing songs. My, I should have the, the, the voice of my son, Shane. He's just like... He's just a solid uh, rock star, this kid, and and uh, so so for three days, you, and then we're going up to San Jose. They're going to come up and open for us in San Jose. So to have my boys on the road with us will be a treat. And then yeah, then the summertime, man, with Sticks and Loverboy, I'm I'm just psyched for that. I mean, Ario and Sticks have become just you know rock and roll best friends. We've done I think this will be the fifth n- national tour we've done with those guys and. Uh, they're just they're they're amazing, and you know they if, if you haven't seen Sticks in a while they they've they've changed man they they're they're a, they're a freaking rock band now you know they're they, they kind of they kind of shed the, the the theatrical side of the band that that was a big part of their success no doubt but uh, you know it's it's they they rock now and they play great and sing great every night and same thing with Loverboy man I I did a tour with. Uh, with uh, Mike Reno and Ian Gillen of, uh, of Deep Purple uh, in 2019 in Europe, where he, all, all three of us took turns fronting a, this giant symphony orchestra and playing our hits in, in front of them. And Mike and I just had a great time. And so when, when it came time to, to figure out who we were going to get to tour with us, I'm like, we got to get, we got to call, call Reno, Reno, yeah. Reno, see what he's doing. And sure enough, those guys were on board and, I mean, I think this tour is going to just kick ass, man. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm excited about it. I mean, and Tommy was on the show not that long ago, too, and Tommy's great. And he loves the rock, so, you know, he's, he, it's, it, it's going to be it'll be good. You know, I meant to ask you, too, Um, you know, it's great with your two sons. You know, it's interesting because, you know, uh, you know, Lars and Metallica's sons, I've been kind of helping those guys out a little bit, coaching them, you know, because they live in town here and they don't live up in the Bay. Um, and, you know, showing up for some of the rehearsals and just talking ideas with them. And I love that. I think it, it's it's cool because it's almost inevitable in a lot of ways. You, Your kids either are into the music thing or they're drawn to that or they kind of go the exact opposite way. But let me ask you this. Do your sons play you any new artists that you like or do they go dad you got to hear this or or you or they ask you to turn them on to some old stuff how does how does that work uh with it, that dynamic? exactly what you say matt is it, it's uh, you know i learned so much from them because because they're you know they're in touch and, and they're you know they're they got their ear to the ground i you know sadly i you, you know the, the 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 new ways of music delivery are you know i'm just trying to get up to speed with it all you know but uh so so, so yeah i mean i you know they, they rehearse at our house so i'm you know I, I i'll be out in the yard listening you know and if i i can't help myself if i hear something that that makes my ears pick up i i'll run and i go dudes that was great what's that you know or so so you know so i you know they and they're they're very cool they um uh, the, the, the beautiful thing in our family was they, Josh and Shane, my sons, 
they were basketball stars first. They, they played basketball from the time they were in fourth grade and all through high school, up until high school. And they were both really good. But my daughter, Holly, who, uh, who uh, is, a, is a talented young lady herself, uh, she's a couple years older. So she was in the choir in, in their high school and she talked the boys into joining the choir because they needed more boys. So my son, Shane, started getting solos in at the at the choir shows and he's he's like wait a second so i can impress girls just as easily by singing as i can by shooting three pointers you know and and i don't have to sweat my ass off for 11 months out of the year you know every day and uh, you know it's, and it didn't take long for them to turn in their air jordans and you know for beetle boots but but i the, i what i was getting at i guess is that in our house, I didn't want to push them at all. You know, we had, there were guitars and drums and pianos all over the house. And there were also basketballs and baseballs and tennis rackets all over the house. There was art equipment. There was, and we just, my, my wife is amazing. And, and our thing was just, let's see where, let, let's see where they go. Wherever they go, it, you know, we'll support them. And, and it's just, it's crazy that they ended up playing in a rock band and during breaks in their rehearsals, they go out and shoot baskets, which is exactly what Ario Speedwagon did for right. years. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's uncanny. And, and and I swear, I didn't push them in that direction at all. It just happened naturally. So, uh, you know, I'm happy for them. And, you know, but you know how, you know, that the music business is a lot different now. And 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 I hope that they can find a niche and 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 make a go of it they got uh they got one more year of college and then you know then they're going to be out there you know going for it big time you know probably traveling around the country in a van just like we did and uh yeah so yeah it's pretty cool that is awesome i think that's great you know it's amazing when when you see our kids grow up around it. It's, I love what you said too, because it was the same thing. You know, I have two daughters, and it was the same thing. I didn't push them in, into any one any type of music or where to go. I kind of let them go with their passion, and that's so important that you do that as parents. It sounds like you and your wife, or you know, did such a great job with them. And I got, like I said, I got to meet the guys at Kaboo, and they were great. I met your sons. You know what I mean? And they were so right. cool. So that oh, and I, man, that was like that was like the biggest. The thing that 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 ever happened to them at that point the, the fact that you were willing to to interview them was and that just meant the world to me and it said a lot about who you are that that, that you're just you know that you're that you're into supporting young bands and, and yeah. giving them a shot and listening to them and talking to them and giving them that experience and you know that's i mean that that's kind of our job we got to help do we got to do what we can i mean when when we, you know, when REO tours in the off season, you know, we will play theaters and, and, uh, and so we, you know, we, we pick up uh, young bands, young artists to, to open the shows for us around the country, just, just the same way bands did with us when we were starting out. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, pay it forward, as they say. And, and my, my boys would never, will will never forget that interview you did. And I, I'll tell them that you were asking about them today. Yeah, tell them I said hello. They were great. I really enjoyed them. I got to say that. And, and that's, it's great. It was, it was really my pleasure. And you're, you know, the same way we just, it is about helping out new young artists and exposing them and, and helping uh, get, get people, let people know they're there and get, get people uh, to pay attention it keeps the, everything going in rock and roll. It's got to happen. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It's so, I love it. And I, I was, I, I really enjoyed the experience. You got to say hi to the guys for me, you know? I, sh I will do that. Absolutely. Ke Kevin, this was great. I really appreciate you taking the time today. It's, man, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I just got to tell well, you. you know? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate being on KLOS. You guys have, uh, have supported our music from from the very beginning and uh uh and and you know it i always say it it's it takes everybody working together from the from the artists from the the crew from the radio stations the people in the venues we're all in this together and and the more we support each other the you know the better the better it's going to be and and uh so i really appreciate you having me on and uh Let's do it again, man. I, I always enjoy seeing you. Yeah, it's great seeing you. One of these days we'll have you come in, you know, when things get a little less crazy with COVID. I'd love to have you in the studio and we'll hang out. That'd be no, great. Love that. That would be great. Yeah, that Kevin, so great. take care and thank you so much for doing the show. It was great to see you. 
You got it, Matt. Great seeing you, too, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Absolutely. You got it. Thank you, Kevin. It's great. All right, man. Kevin Cronin, everybody, from Ario Speedwagon, doing shows in Southern California, January 12th, January 14th. The 12th is Thousand Oaks, and that's at the Civic uh, Center there. And the place that used to be called The Grove on the 14th might still be have something to do with the title. And then, of course, the tour of the summer we're really excited about. It's great to have Kevin. Love catching up with him. Thank you so much for watching us. I'm Matt Pinfield. This is KLOS, new and approved.